But yeah, that that also brings us nicely into uh, one of the other biggest stories of the year, I think, was uh, when Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, very much in the context of this uh, Russia-Ukraine kerfluffle. Well, she visited back in August, August, right? Yeah. Yeah. She was going to visit earlier in the year, but then she got COVID, so she didn't go. But what uh, surprised me about the whole Nancy Pelosi visiting Taiwan thing is the amount of pressure put on her by White House officials to not go. Yeah, that's it, it that was, was kind of shocking. It was not a good look for the Biden administration. No. Well, neither is like the four times now Biden has said the U.S. would defend Taiwan if China invaded. And then people in his administration are like, no, 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 uh, no. no. Yeah, we're not changing uh, <laughs> uh, U.S. Taiwan policy. It's yeah. No, no, not even Taiwan. Would you one China policy? Yeah. yeah. I mean, what he's saying isn't necessarily uh, even has to do with the one China policy in a certain way. Like it has nothing to do with who's China or not, right? Like what he said was just that like, we will defend Taiwan if China invades. And that's just like going too far for certain, you know, bureaucrats or. Yeah, it's really, I mean, we'll get to this in a bit when we talk about Biden's China policy, because that was unveiled this year. Uh, that was another one of the big stories. But uh, yeah, you really see sort of this dissonance in the U.S. government and U.S. society more broadly about, uh, you know, people who understand that the Chinese Communist Party, you know, is a genocidal regime using rape as a form of torture, who has dedicated itself to destroying America and the people who think they can make money there. Yeah. I mean, I think I think Nancy Pelosi understands the problem with the the Chinese genocide stuff. And, and she, to her credit, has been talking about Tibet as an issue since the 90s, back when that was cool to talk about. And she kind of quieted down a bit during the sort of uh, Bush, the Bush Obama years. I don't I don't know if she was that vocal during like when Bill Clinton was pushing for the WTO stuff either. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't remember. I was pretty young then. I'd like to think so. Uh, but yeah, I mean, but at any rate, she's she's kind of come back in force and has been you know, pretty outspoken about that stuff. And so that is, that is to her credit. And it's not just Pelosi who visited Taiwan, although she's the highest profile person, because mm-hmm. a number of other members of Congress oh, yeah, have visited Taiwan this dozens year. Dozens of um, congressional delegations that have gone to Taiwan this year. And not just from the US, there's actually been a lot of uh, pretty high ranking officials from a lot of other countries visiting Taiwan too. Because again, I think in the context of, the, of Russia invading Ukraine, people realize that it's not, when China says they want to invade Taiwan, it's not just empty talk. Yeah, and that has much more of a a the possibility of immediately bringing in like Japan and South Korea. Like it starts mm-hmm. to affect all of Asia very very quickly. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it would be nicer to help prevent an invasion of Taiwan than have to hang Taiwanese flags on our porches after the invasion happens. Hey, but at least we'll be doing something, Chris. That's right. Hey, you know what? Maybe I'll change my Facebook profile to having the Taiwanese flag. Really be making a stand then. That's a great idea. Well, the the U.S. is increasingly showing its support for Taiwan. The latest uh, National Defense Authorization Act is uh, more pro-Taiwan, basically allocated up to $2 billion in loans so that Taiwan could buy American military equipment, which is a little bit of like a self-serve thing too, because it's like, I'm loaning you money to buy stuff from me and you still have to pay me back. It's win-win mutual cooperation. That is that yeah. is kind of belt and roadie, yeah. <laughs> it, it is. So I think it's a little funny how that's written, but nonetheless, just the idea that like, yeah, we're authorizing Taiwan to like, we well, want to I do think this also trade with having the whole thing about, like, the U.S. military should invite them to RIMPAC. Yeah, that, I, I think, was the most significant thing uh, in the new Defense Authorization Act. Yeah, because I mean, the U.S. has never done joint military operations with Taiwan, at least since uh, Taiwan was disinvited from the United Nations, right? And so... 
RIMP, RIMPAC is basically a, a large scale joint military exercise between a whole bunch of countries. Uh, I think last year it was like, like, you know, eight or nine countries. Doesn't matter. U.S. is the best, most important one. And, and I agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but adding Taiwan, it's not not that we're necessarily going to do it, but at least there's like the suggestion to do it. Yeah, it just suggested it. So and, it does, that might not happen right. at all. Yeah. And, and, and so he, I mean, that's been a politically sensitive thing for years now. Right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, keep in mind, just like, you know, six, seven years ago, the U.S. was inviting the Chinese People's Liberation Army to join RIMPAC. And yeah, that's a like, special kind of stupid. It, w it was really dumb. And it was happening during the Obama years. And then, you know, the Trump administration at some point was just like, uh, actually, China, you're disinvited. And they were they were uh, angry. It angered China. But, you know, Trump, uh, you know, like Honey Badger, did not care. Yeah. I mean, the idea that the China, like the Communist Party's People's Liberation Army would be in RIMPACT makes RIMPACT such a joke. It should be called RIMSHOT. I knew you were going somewhere with that. <laughs> um, I think, I think that's, that's, that's not bad. I mean, it's like on my level. 2023, but... <laughs> it's my year. Uh, yeah, I guess your New Year's resolution Boom. is not about using fewer puns. But like any country that joins RIMPAC gets to understand how the American military operates, right? Kind of. So... I mean, it's it's kind of like... I think we had a guest on the podcast once talk about how like RIMPAC is like a showy thing. So it gets like the most attention in terms of inviting Taiwan there would be a statement. But he was like, I don't know that that's that the actual real, right, we should, the most useful thing. Right. His do. suggestion was actually bilateral joint yeah. military operations. And and we should do those. But realistically, RIMPAC is a, is a first step in that. And it's going to anger China. And that's okay. It's okay. We just have to sort of sit with that that feeling of of uh, uh, discomfort. Yeah, I remember when uh, Pelosi visited Taiwan. Like all the articles were like Pelosi visits Taiwan, comma angering China. Yeah, everything that has to do with Taiwan is always angering, angering China. China. But but China is like Bruce Banner. It's yeah. always angry. I do have to give Pelosi credit for this, which is that she told the Washington Post that. Um, or someone from her office leaked this to the Washington Post that she had told White House officials that she would not go to Taiwan if Biden called her and personally asked her not to go. But then she would also tell the media that she was not going because Biden called her and personally asked her to go, not go. So yeah. it was a very neat way to kind of prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no. She's, she's got chutzpah and I'll give her that. Yep. Uh, which, all right. So I think this now goes very nicely into uh, the, the unveiling of the Biden China policy because this, this all ties in. Um, you know, after a year and a half, Biden finally unveiled the, the China policy, which better late than never, better never late. I mean, I think it's a little unfair to expect them to have one like from day one, but mm -hmm. a year and a half. Is yeah, a I, I would expect it from like six months, though, instead of 16 months. I think the. Uh, well, it was technically Antony Blinken, right? Who uh, did the speech unveiling it. And even that got delayed a bit because I think he got COVID too. Oh, jeez. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which like, the my, the great thing about 2023 is it's looking a lot like 2020. Oh, yeah. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Oh, goodness. Oh. We'll get to that. Um, but yeah. Uh, so in, in, in Antony Blinken's speech, like there were a lot of good things. And overall, I think the Biden administration has done some very good things when it comes to China. Uh, but so like in Blinken's speech, he he talked about, you know, China's human rights violations. He used the G word. He used the G word. He specifically said, you know, China, it's committing genocide. But we still got to work with them, right? Or I We don't want to anger them. We I think it conflict. was kind of more like, because there was also part of it where he was like, we don't want a cold war with China. We're not trying to keep China down, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So it was like almost trying to firewall the speech against like CCP propaganda that would say those kinds of things. But it doesn't really matter. They're going to say that stuff anyway. Yeah. And it really just kind of it, it revealed the fundamental problem uh, of the Biden administration in regards to China, the failure to realize that, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is a Marxist Leninist state. Uh, it, it's, it is considered itself, it already considers itself at war with the United States. It's not something that can be 
peacefully, we can't peacefully coexist with it. I think there was a lot of like, oh, well, we could, you know, if only the Chinese government would um, come to the, you know, liberal international order. He didn't use those words. But like the idea was essentially that like they could join the international order and be one of the good guys. You know, they just have to make the decision to do that. Yeah, except that the last 20 years of working with China has shown that what actually happens is the liberal world joins China's new world order and takes on sort of Chinese ideas of mass surveillance and, you know, the lockdowns that happened uh, through COVID was a, was a very Chinese idea. And we, and we just get very dependent on them. The same thing with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. People were very, countries around the world were very dependent on Russia. And being dependent on an authoritarian regime is not a good idea. And like the whole idea that like, you know, I always say this, China uses rape as a form of torture. I don't think telling them like, hey, you know, that's, that's not nice. That's not going to change thing. It's it's not like they're you know, like, oh, I didn't say, realize it was not nice. No, 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 Chris. Bullies respond to polite requests. Well, I mean, I do think we have to understand that the speech is made in the context of like it's a diplomatic speech by the State Department. So it's going to be. So it's going to be wishy-washy. I mean, I don't think that follows necessarily. No, I think it's there is definitely even in um even when Pompeo was in charge of the State Department or whatever, there there did Oh, he called them communist. He was one step away from calling him uh, what's that phrase, Shelley? Nope. But my point I don't think is he said nope. He he called them the, the Nope, he didn't even say anything close to that. So say close nice to, try. To, to, uh... <laughs> but like you have to be like, oh well, if they wanted to change, then sure, fine. You know what I mean? So I don't think that's the part that's the problem. I think the part that's the problem is that like you have these opposing forces within any administration when it comes to China. You have the people who are going to be like, you know, they're always called China hawks, right? Mm-hmm. Like the people who understand the the actual dangers of the Chinese Communist Party. Typically these are people more in like defense. Like national security, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then you have the people who are like the, the engagers, the, the whatever. John Kerry's shoves. Like, yeah, the people who are like, oh, well, you know, we should just try to, like, let's not, like, decoupling is so harsh. Like, maybe there are still industries when we can work together, even though we're now trying to basically shut down their entire semiconductor industry. But as we far have as to possible. work with them on climate change, Shelley. Actually, there are signs that the Biden administration is going to try to. <laughs> I don't know if they're going to be as successful at this, but they're going to try to limit China's technology when it comes to uh, climate stuff and biotech. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, made a speech uh, a few months ago that kind of indicated some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't think a lot of people paid attention to it. I certainly didn't. And then, then there was an article in Politico uh, last week that definitely was kind of like a plant article by the Biden administration that uh-huh. was like uh, about how the Biden administration is getting really tough on China, uh, Chinese trade. But it pointed out that like the Biden administration is about to do a bunch of things that focus not just on the semiconductor stuff, like mm-hmm. not just on quantum computing. I think actually there was something recently about quantum computing that the Biden administration did too. Uh, but they're also going to go and look at the biotech stuff and the like climate green technology stuff and try to limit China's ability to take over those industries too for national security reasons. Interesting, interesting. And I mean, yeah, let's talk about some of the good things. Like, you know, there well, well, Congress passed the CHIPS Act and then Biden also did uh, made his executive order uh, that very limited – China's access to, you know, U.S. semiconductors, and that really had a huge impact on their economy and in that field. 